the OLC for zero. This is term 1B. Class, oh. Welcome to OLC term the four zero term one B class five unit one. We're working on assignment six and seven today, and it is Tuesday, November twenty first, and I am Jillian Percy. Okay, so today's work we're going to be understanding different types of sentences, learning about different ways to ask a question, learning how to use questions as a reading strategy and understanding how to make predictions and connections before reading a text. And then we're going to complete uh, assignment number six and assignment number seven. So first off, there's four basic sentence types and their punctuation. You probably already know these, but we're just kind of reviewing, just make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the main sentence types are declarative, <clears throat> interrogative, imperative, and exclamatory. Most of these follow the format of subject first and then predicate. So declarative or a statement, this is the most common type of sentence. It simply tells you information or gives you description or narration or opinions. And they always end with a period. So examples might be, I like the red car. The train leaves at 1.15 p.m. The tree was covered in red and yellow leaves. Exclamatory sentences. These express strong emotion and sometimes loud volume. And they end with an exclamation point. Now, a lot of times, if they had a period at the end, they would work just fine as uh, declarative sentences, okay? So, I hate you. Today is the best day ever. The murderer is one of us. I will love you forever. So, all of those are showing strong emotion or a lot of volume, okay? Imperative sentences. These are commands. V can end with a period or they can sometimes end with an exclamation point, depending on the type of emotion. These generally start with the verb. The subject is assumed, but not written, and it's assumed as always being you. It's always like somebody's addressing another person, but they don't say, you do this. They just kind of say, they start with the verb. So like, get out of here. Technically, it's like, you get out of here, but they aren't writing the you. Put the chicken in the oven at 350 degrees Celsius turn left at the corner to go to the grocery store. So these are all different types of commands, or sometimes you might think of them as instructions. The big thing with these is they start with the verb generally. Okay, Inter interrogative or question sentences. Basically, these are sentences that ask a question and use a question mark at the end of it. So we'll talk more about questions later. We're just going to cover the basics today. Many questions start with the main question words. Who? Oh, why does it keep doing this? I'm so sorry. I've not figured out why it does this. We did have some updates done yesterday. So it's possible that's why. Okay. Let me find where we are. Okay. Uh, many questions start with question words. Who, what, where, when, why, or how? So, who are you? What are you doing this evening? Where did the money go? When does school end? Why is your brother crying? Now, a lot of times the question word is kind of functioning as the subject and then you have the verb. Okay. Okay. Not always, but a lot of times. Um, okay, so we're going to look at these sentences and try and decide what type of sentence is it, okay? Democracy is when you choose a leader through voting. Is that declarative, interrogative, imperative, or exclamatory? Well, they're telling us something. There's no command, there's no question, and there's no strong emotion. So therefore, it is declarative. Declarative is kind of like the default sentence. I'm scared. Okay. It could be declarative, but it's got that exclamation point, which means it's got to be exclamatory. The town meeting starts at eight o'clock tonight. Okay. Well, it's not a question. It's not um, exclamation, exclamatory because it has not got an exclamation point. Um, it's not a command. It is again, declarative. What day is your race on? Okay, so the question mark cues you that it is 
interrogative. Clean up this mess right now. Okay. It starts with a verb, and that is our clue that it is an imperative sentence. It is a command sentence. Help me. Um, declarative, interrogative, imperative, or exclamatory. Help me is an exclamatory. Um, now, if you said that it were a command, I would take that as well, because it is kind of a command, right? Because it does start with a verb as well. So that would be possible too. Okay. This lesson is about questions that we are asked or that we are asking ourselves about what we read. Um, questions can be asked at various different times. We can ask questions before we read something, during our reading of something, or after we read something. A lot of research shows that reading with a question in mind, your own question or someone else's question, can often help you remember what you read more effectively. It also gives you a point of view to look at the text through. Okay, so there are three main categories of questions. There are directly stated questions, indirectly stated questions, and making connections. So they've kind of lo uh, loosely given us some keywords. Um, for directly stated information, the questions are going to have words like find, list, locate, identify, or tell. For indirectly stated questions, you might have things like predict, use clues, think about, or for making connections, you might have things about what do you think about, what do you do if, or in your opinion. So lesson two um, is all about reading and before, during, and after. And a skill for reading and answering questions you'll be using during this course. Uh, being able to understand directly stated information and ideas and texts or reading on the lines, like directly, what's there, what's been said. Or understanding indirectly stated information and ideas in the texts, reading between the lines, or making connections between personal experiences and ideas and information in texts. Most reading questions you'll be asked through this course will fall under one of the above categories. The trick is to learn the key words which will help you figure out what type of question you are being asked. Once you know what you are being asked, even if you are unsure of the answer, you will know how to complete it. Here are a few keywords for each category, which we've just talked about. Can you think of others? Note, not every question is going to contain a keyword, but after a while, you're going to recognize the type or the pattern of question being asked as you go along. These are just some examples to kind of help you out in the beginning, okay? Let me just kind of pull up a little YouTube thing here real quick. Once everything's Sorry, perfectly organized, I'll start working. Sorry, my apologies there. Um types of questions in English. Okay. Okay. Hang on a second. Hello, I'm Emma from M mm English. Asking questions and giving answers are the basics of great conversation in English and in any language. But are you doing it correctly in English? Many of my students can get by, they can get their message across, even without the correct structure, word order or intonation. But it makes for a very bumpy, awkward conversation. In this lesson, I want to help you improve the structure of your questions so that they flow smoothly, clearly, and automatically. And finally, you can start enjoying English conversations. It's important to spend some time improving your Q&A skills. Have you heard that before? Q&A? It stands for question and answers. You might have heard it somewhere before. Q&A. First up, let's review question structure in English. Now, the good news is that English questions are fairly consistent and easy to follow because they have a clear structure. There are four main parts that you need to keep in mind. 
The first part, question words. Who, what, where, when, how, why, or question phrases like how long, or how often, or how much. Then number two is your auxiliary verb or your helping verb. Be, do, or have. It can also be a modal auxiliary verb like can, or will, or should. Thirdly, you need your subject. I, you, we, etc. And your main verb. Any verb. Play, eat, buy. These are the four things that you need and you need them in that order every time. Okay, let's try with some examples. Ready? Where do you live? Question word, auxiliary, subject, main verb. What do you like about it? Question word, auxiliary, subject, main verb. How long have you been living there? Question phrase, auxiliary verb, subject, main verb. Okay, so what about this type of question? Do you live in England? In this question, we don't have a question word, but we do have all of the other parts of the English question structure. We don't have the question word, but we do have the auxiliary verb, do, the subject, you and the main verb live. It's as simple as that every time. This type of question is perfectly acceptable too. You don't need to have a question word. There are two types of questions in English. Closed questions, the questions which start with an auxiliary verb, and open questions questions which start with a question word or a question phrase. Keep that in mind for a few minutes. Questions that start with an auxiliary verb or a helping verb are closed questions because they require just a simple answer, yes or no. The detail is not really important. Do you like the soup? No, I don't. Can you help me for a minute? Yeah, I can. Have you been to Italy? No, I haven't. Are you enjoying the movie? Yeah, I am. <laughs> Another good tip here is the connection between the question and the answer. See how the answer directly responds to the information in the question. Are you? Yeah, I am. No, I'm not. Have you? No, I haven't. Yeah, I have. There are lots of patterns in English questions. So if you start paying attention to the detail, you'll really be able to improve your grammar. Questions that start with a question. Okay, so I'm going to take a break there. Let me come back to that. I apologize. I'm not feeling the greatest and I'm um... So uh, we may start that again if we need to. All right, let's take a look at directly stated information. So this is the information that is clearly told to us in the text. And often the way they word the question is a clue that this will be the case. It will be very specific and often detail oriented. When did he get to school? Who does he live with? Where did the little boy go? What happened when the principal called him into the office? This is the kind of questions where either you'll remember it or if you reread it, you will find it really clearly stated. It'll just be right there. All right. Making connections. This is one of the trickier things. And it, a lot of this depends on um, a little bit on when you went to school, right? This is one of those things they ask a lot these days, but they didn't ask a whole lot when I was in school, for example. It's kind of one of those newer things that they ask a about a lot. So you may be very unfamiliar with these type of questions um, if you didn't go to a school where this was the kind of stuff they, they discussed. Um, making connections is basically where you find similarities between the text, what you're reading, and something else. It can be between the text and yourself, 
or between one text and another text, or it can be between the text and the world. It can even be all three at once, okay? So text to yourself in this type is when you're looking for connections between your life and the character or feelings and events and the story that you're reading. So for example, I can relate to how Josh probably feels when Karen turns him down at the dance. I bet he feels embarrassed, even though he starts acting angry. So there, I'm looking at a, something that happened in the text, and I am thinking about how I would feel, or I have felt, when that has happened. Um, text to text is when you look for connections between the text that you're reading and another text that you might have similar events or themes. So for example, both Maggie and Jennifer are nurses in the middle of a war. Maggie is in the Middle East in modern times, and Jennifer is a nurse in World War I. But they both feel overwhelmed by all the death and despair they see all around them. So sometimes um, one book may remind you of another book, or in some classes, you might be doing like a theme like war or um, uh, persecution or love. And the teacher may ask you specifically to compare two books because they want you to, to notice the similarities, for example. Um, text to world is where you're looking for connections between what you're reading and events that are occurring right now or that have occurred in real life in the world. So for example, this book is occurring in the aftermath of a hurricane. I have never been in a hurricane, but I have watched the news during Hurricane Katrina, and I saw the reports on the lack of food, clean water, and safe housing. So this book seems very realistic to me. Text to World is really useful, A, if you um, don't have a personal connection. A lot of times you might be reading something that didn't happen to you, but you've seen it happen to others. And so it can still give you a way to understand the text. And all of these have the underlying theme of using those comparisons to help you get a better understanding of what you're reading. Okay. Indirectly stated information. Now, these are the ones that are the typhus type of questions because you often have to read between the lines, which is kind of an idiomatic statement. And what we mean is it's not said directly. You're going to have to look at what is said and kind of make a judgment call, right? You're going to have to give your opinion, even if you're not 100% sure. And I know for some people that is super tricky. They just don't feel comfortable answering a question like that when they don't feel like they know 100%. But this kind of question, you have to kind of just go there. That's what they're asking for. So for example, a question might say, how do you think the character feels? But when you reread that um, part of the story, there isn't really any sentence that tells you how he feels. But the moment you see that phrase, how do you think, it means that they're asking for your opinion. So even though it doesn't say how he feels, it does say that he shouted, he slammed the door, he went outside, and he kicked the dog. And they want you to look at that and decide, in your opinion, what is he feeling? So from all those clues, you might guess that he feels angry. And your answer might say something like this. I think in this situation that the character feels angry for several reasons. First, he starts shouting at his mother. Later, he slams the door and walks off. And then finally, he kicks the dog as he walks away. These all seem like the actions of an angry person. So you explain what you're looking at to make your decision and explain why you're, you're giving your opinion, okay? So some other phrases that it might indicate that they want an opinion or for you to make it an inference. Things like, what do you think caused this action? Or how do you imagine the character feels about what just happened? Make a prediction about what Betty will do next based on her actions and statements in the book. In your opinion, what should the character do next? Use clues from the chapter to predict what event will happen next. Think about the character's problems and make suggestions about how he might solve it. So all of these are things where you are looking at the book, 
right? And you're looking at what's happening, but you're going to have to kind of go beyond that to think about, hmm, what do I think is happening or what do I think might happen? What do I think somebody is feeling? That kind of thing. Um, so these are kind of, they're, I think they're the more, most challenging questions we have, but they do get asked a lot. So be aware that they will be asked throughout this course too. Um, and then I'm putting this here just because in your unit, it, this is where they have it. It seems like a really odd place for it, but nonetheless, um, at the end of this particular lesson, on page 36, you're going to find a reading log. It'll look like this. Um, make several copies of this page because you're going to need them. As you go through this course, you're encouraged to keep a record of the kind of things you're reading apart from the course. So not the things that we're reading, but what you read when you're not doing your work. So websites that you might visit, emails, texts, magazines, newspapers, any other reading you might do, including reading that you do at your own work, for example, if you're working. Um, this log is going to become part of your literacy portfolio, which is during lesson 20. So make sure you fill it in every day if you can. And, you know, it sounds funny because people often are thinking about reading novels, but we do reading almost every single day, right? We may read street signs or posters or Facebook messages or grocery lists or birthday cards or there's so many things that we often read but we just don't even notice and so this reading log is to try and to get us to help to notice what we're reading so here's an example it asks for the date what type of text it is um, who's the title or the author there's not always room for a lot you can put one or the other the length of time spent reading or the number of pages read and then the main idea or comment. So here's an example. On November 18th, I read a magazine. It was called Cosmopolitan. I spent about 20 minutes reading it and I was looking at the fall fashion article. So that would be an example. Now, after we do all this, under here is an assignment. And I don't know why they start it right there. It's such a crazy spot to start it, but they do. Um, this is talking about, um, before reading, you can ask questions. What are some questions you can ask yourself before reading to help yourself understand this text? What do I already know? I wonder if, what do I need to know? Now we're going to talk about this a little bit in a, as I finish this. Okay, so here, here is the main question. I don't know why they started it early, but that's, that's what they did. Um, you're about to read book number one. Oh, sorry, chapter number one of Jimmy Comes Home of the Green Star Lake series by Robert Chekwich. Before you begin reading it, take some time to judge the book by its cover. Take some time to just hold the book in your hands and look at the different features to give yourself an idea about what the series might be about. Use the following questions as guidelines to help you. Notice that some of the key question words have been highlighted for you. Indicate whether the question is asking you about directly stated information, DS, indirectly stated information, IS, or making a connection, MC, by circling your choice. Think about the title and write at least three sentences to predict what will happen in the story. Hopefully you'll come back to your prediction as you read and compare your ideas with what actually does happen. Now, is this uh, DS, directly stated information? Is it uh, IS, indirectly stated information, or is it MC, making a connection? All right. The moment you're looking at predict, you're talking about indirectly stated information. Um, number two, what do you think about the title of this novel? Does it suggest any connections to your own life or raise any questions? Come up with three questions you have about the plot of the novel you're about to read. As you read the novel later on, come back to your questions and see if they've been answered. Again, is this DS, IS, or MC? Um, and then the last question for, no, this isn't the last question. There's a few. This is a long one for some reason. Um, number three, look the novel over and jot down your opinions or thoughts about the following. The length of the novel, the organization of the novel, and the level of language, the words used in the novel. So for number one, think about what genre of story is this, first of all. Is it realistic? Is it fantasy? Is it a mystery? And how does the genre affect your predictions? 
what does the title, Jimmy Comes Home, kind of imply? That he's been away, right? What might be some reasons that Jimmy was away? Why might he be home? What are some things that might occur in a novel about a young boy returning home to his reserve? Now, I know because I've talked to a few people, some people have read ahead a little bit. Try to make your predictions based on what you thought about before you ever read anything, okay? Um, what do you think about the title? Any connections? Come up with three questions that you might have about the plot, okay? Um, same way as like, if you were talking about going to see a movie with some friends, you might ask them some questions like, oh, is this action adventure? Who's going to be in it? Do you know any, like a lot of times we ask questions before we decide whether we're going to want to see a movie. Those are the same kinds of questions that you might ask about a book. Okay. Question number two is tricky because it asks a lot of questions at once and it can be easy to forget one of them. So first of all, what do you think about the title? Two, does it, it meaning the title, does the title suggest any connections to your own life? Or does it raise any questions? Like, does it make you think about questions you have in your mind? Then create three questions about the plot. Okay. Making connections to yourself. Okay. This is an area where sometimes people have a hard time so I tried to kind of brainstorm all the different ways that you might make connections to yourself. So here you are, very happy, smiley person in the middle. And sometimes you may feel like you've got a lot of connections to certain characters, or you may feel like you have very few connections to a character. And I think it's when we don't feel like we have a lot of connections, when there's just not that much in common, that it can be tricky. So some things that you can look at are, Maybe they're going through similar events or situations. Maybe they have similar personality traits, like they're both very, you're, you are determined and so are they. Or maybe you're feeling kind of shy and they're kind of shy. May have similar heritage, culture, religion, gender, age, or sexual orientation. I know when I was younger, sometimes I would try and read books that were about people that were older and they just didn't interest me, but in part because I didn't have any connections to them. Right? Especially if it was about old men. Well, I didn't have the same gender. I didn't have the same age. They'd often go on three events I didn't know anything about. It just made it really hard to make connections between me and the book. Um, might have gone through similar feelings. We've all, you know, felt all the different feelings that exist, I think, in most times. Um, so generally, if you're really struggling for a way to connect to a character, think about what they're feeling. Love. Um, abandonment, hope, betrayal, um, anxiety. Even if you haven't been in the exact same situation, you might have felt that same feeling and know how it affects what you think or do. Okay. You might live in similar communities or regions, landforms, climate, or politics. So, for example, um, if I've always lived my whole life on the plains where it's very flat, I may find it very easy to understand a book um, written even in another country where they're also living on the plains and there's also a lot of farming and there's also a lot of similarities, right? Or climate, right? When Canada has a very cold, icy kind of climate, sometimes when you're reading books written in, say, like Russia, for example, there's a lot of similarities, right, between how people have lived there, even though it's very far away, different language, different political structure, and yet there's similarities due to the climate. Um, similar friends, family, or romantic relationships. This is one of those things where, like, um, similar friends, you know, we've all had that friend that maybe encouraged us to do the wrong thing. Or that friend that sticks by us no matter what. Um, family could be, you know, the favorite auntie or the grandmother that looks out for us. Romantic relationships, right? The ones that have gone wonderful, the ones that have gone horrible. Uh, we may have similar strengths or weaknesses, like in our character, or similar interests or activities, right? Um, there's all sorts of mysteries that are written about, like quilting, which seems like an odd setting for mysteries, except there's lots of people that like quilting. And so they'll happily read books, even if they're mysteries about quilting. So these are just some ways that you can think of to make connections to yourself. Creating three questions about the plot. Some question words we talked about are who, when, where, 
why, how, what, or what happened. Sometimes you'll have words like do, is, are, will, or have. And the lady talked about that a little bit on her um, on her uh, video there. I can't just write a question word. You can't just write who, right? That's not adequate. You'd have to write, you know, who are going to be the main characters in this course, in this book, right? Or who is going to help Jimmy, you know, find his way or something like that. You have to relate it to the plot of the novel in some way. Plot just refers to the events in the novel. For example, will Jimmy's homecoming be successful and happy? That would be a question about the plot. Oh, okay. Okay. So actually, hang on a second. So this is all of chapter six. There's three main questions. They're just a little bit uh, tricky. The last one, think about what you think about the length. Is it too long? Is it too short? The organization. What do you think about the chapter length, the titles? Um, how do you feel about it? The level of the language. Books can be written at a very high level, at kind of um, uh, an average level that, you know, like anybody can read. Books can be written at a very, very low level sometimes um, because they're um, written for younger people or because they're trying to convey how a certain character might think. Um, sometimes books can be written in like poetry or uh, um, very what they call stream of consciousness where it just sounds like somebody thinking, which can be kind of hard to read because it's kind of all over the place. So what do you think about the level of the language, um, sentence structure, words, vocabulary, that kind of thing that they used in the novel? Okay, so that's assignment six. And then we have assignment seven. Okay, the questions begin on page 30. Assignment seven is worth 16 marks. And this is one of those ones that it takes up quite a few pages. And what I find happening is people think they're done and they don't notice like the last couple questions. So you'll have to really pay attention when you do this one and really uh, take some time to notice uh, whether you've finished all the questions. So obviously I'm going to go through them, but just as you're doing it, be, be mindful of that. So they have a little thing here. I'm going to come back to this because I think it's confusing where they've put it. Um, you can always ask questions during reading. Now is your chance to get started with Jimmy Comes Home. There are some things to think about when you're reading chapter one. Not only should you keep the above questions, the ones right here, in mind as you read, but as with any assignment in which you're asked to answer questions based on the information provided in the texts, it is always best to read the questions before you read the text. This helps guide you when you're reading for information and makes the answers kind of pop out of the text. So read the following questions before you read chapter one and then answer them using the Raprock method on the next page where appropriate. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so I want to go, first of all, you keep seeing this thing where it goes, it has a sentence like, what does the writer say about? And then we have dot, dot, dot. That is something called an ellipse, okay? And we're beginning to see them in a lot of our assignment. It's basically just a set of three dots or periods in a row. But what does it mean? It's usually being used here to show that words are being omitted or left out. And in the case of these assignments, it means that you need to finish the sentence with your own words. For example, a prompt that reads, I wonder, dot, 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 is asking you to finish the sentence with something that you wonder about. So like this, I wonder why Jimmy doesn't want to talk to Teresa. Now, the ellipse does have other meanings. So it can be used in dialogue or thought bubbles to show that a character is trailed off into silence. So for example, Betty said, Lynn lied when she told the police she was with me. Maybe she's the one who, and she's not finishing her sentence, right? Because that happens in real life. Sometimes it's used to indicate a pause for dramatic effect. For example, Sherlock looked around the room at all the suspects gathered there. The murderer is Lady Ashton. Right. And it's showing the how somebody's talking. The dot, dot, dot is showing that they're being silent for a minute. 
Sometimes it's also used to indicate there's more information to come. For example, comic book stories will often come in installments. And then at the end of the, the first part of the story, it might say to be continued dot, dot, dot. And it's showing you, you know what, the story isn't over. There's going to be more in the next chapter or the next um, month's magazine or whatever. Okay. So it can have all of these meanings. The way we're seeing it used, it's generally meaning, hey, this sentence isn't finished. You're going to have to finish it yourself. Okay. So here is Rap Rock. Now, this, I think, kind of confused some people. It's basically just a way to get you to write long is how we would think of it. Sometimes we get kind of used to in school writing the shortest answer we can think of just to get it over and get it done with. But in this course, that's really not going to get you very many marks. So we're going to practice writing long. And this is just um, an acronym. An acronym is where you have the first letter of the important words, which horribly is the word rap rock. It doesn't really sound like a real word. But anyways, this is um, one way to write these kind of questions. It also works really well if you're doing your journal entries. So first, uh, the first R is for restate. Use words from the question to begin your answer. A is for answer, answer the question. P is for prove. Use ideas and examples from the text to support your answer. R is for relate. Make connections to yourself, other texts, and the world. O is for opinion. Explain what you think about everything and why. C is for conclude. Wrap it up with a good ending. The following is an example of a question being answered using this method. Now, I want to point out, first of all, before I even go far, they didn't actually follow their own method. They did about half of this. It does still make a thorough answer, but I just want to point that out because I think that's kind of confusing. So what they've got is, why is Jimmy upset at the airport when he hears that they've started going through everyone's bags? Because he did not have anything illegal on him. And so, oh, Jimmy is upset at the airport when he hears they've started going through everyone's bags because he did not have anything illegal on him. And so he thought it was an unnecessary invasion of his privacy. He says to Frank, no bloody way they're searching my body. I just left Juvie pit four hours ago. How could I have anything on me? Page two. So let's take the answer apart so you can see what they mean. First, they began to restate the question. Why is Jimmy upset at the airport? Jimmy is upset at the airport because. And then they give their answer. He hears they've started going through everyone's luggage. They also are doing body searches, which they don't mention, but that's partly why he's upset. He feels this is an invasion of privacy because he does not have anything illegal on him prove it. So here they use a quote from the, the chapter to prove what they've just said. Jimmy says, no bloody way they're searching my body. I just left GV four hours ago. How could I have anything on me? And then they also gave the page number where it was that quote is from. Um, relate. Relate is where you're making connections. So then I've, I've kind of continued their answer. I always hate when they search my bags as it makes me feel guilty even when I haven't done anything. Opinion. I don't think they really should do that as it is assumes you are a criminal. Conclude. I think Jimmy has a right to be upset and suspicious about this. Now, as you're writing me your answer, you obviously wouldn't actually write the word restate, answer, prove, relate, opinion, conclude. I just broke it up into those pieces so you can kind of see how each question relates to that that um, prompt, I guess. Okay, so the actual questions for assignment seven don't start until page 29, but they keep going to page 31. So first of all, where did Jimmy spend the last 18 months of his life and why? How does Jimmy feel about being home? Use clues from the text to answer this. Number three, pretend that a friend has asked you what this book is about and what Jimmy is like. Write a message to your friend giving your opinion of Jimmy, the situation he is in, and any interesting comments you may like to share with your friend. The purpose here is to get your friend to read the book so the two of you can discuss it together. Number four, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to just ignore this for the moment, okay? Number four, as you were reading the text, was there a point where you paused to think 
about something in your own life or something that you've read or watched before. Use two of the during reading make connection prompts above to explain using full sentences. So this is kind of, I think the way they, the way they formatted it, I think is confusing. So this whole section here should really basically be under here, okay? Was there a point where you paused to think about something in your own life or something you've read or watched before. Now, they've listed one, two, three, four, five possible prompts here. You only have to pick two and make connections with those two. I already know about whatever you know about that connects to the story. This text reminds me of, and it could be something from your life, or it could be like another book. This compares to, again, could be something from your life, a book, real world. This text is different from, now what is it different from? Different from your life, different from a specific book, different from the real world. And then you would explain what? This section made me think about, and then you would explain, what did it make you think about? So if there's one or two of these that you think are really hard, don't pick those. Pick the ones that you think are easy to use, okay? Um, making connections. We can make a lot of different connections. We can connect to something in the text, something in the text to something happening in the real world. For example, this story reminds me of something a friend went through when she, and then I would explain. Or we can connect to another book. This sounds like another book I read with the main character also, and then explain what they did. We can also make connections to our own lives, our own feelings, ideas, situations, and identities. We're going to go to the next page to see more of this. We can connect by thinking about similar events. For example, going through a divorce, leaving home, starting college, having a child, make, getting married. We can connect by thinking about similar emotions, times when we felt happy, sad, scared, confused, betrayed, abandoned, depressed, welcomed, and safe. This is similar to what I was talking about before. I'm just doing it slightly differently. We can connect by thinking about similar situations, families, communities, natural disasters, diseases, heritage. For example, a family situation where you live with the grandparents or living through a hurricane or a house fire or getting a diagnosis of cancer or some other disease, living in a big city or living in a small town or a reservation, similar languages or race or culture or gender. Even if a character has done something we haven't, like for example, they've committed a murder, say, sometimes we can still help ourselves understand their actions by thinking about times when we got mad or when we lost control or we felt betrayed. Or maybe we can think about a friend of ours who got really mad and beat somebody up and we can think about, you know, maybe we talked to them afterwards and how they felt and what they were thinking and what prompted that. So it's not 100% important to make connections all the time, but in this particular question, they are focusing it on, and it is because a lot of times, if we can't make any connections to the characters, it can make the book a lot harder to read. Whereas if we think about our connections, it can make the book a lot more understandable. Okay, this is one that people get drop off. Here, they're trying to show one way you can visualize, okay? Pretend you've been asked to turn this first chapter into a strip, like a comic strip, with at least four pictures. You are to sketch the main ideas in this chapter. If you're not an artist, don't worry. Stick figures are okay as long as the main ideas get across. Use a full page for your four pictures. So all they want you to do is draw four pictures of the main activities that happen in chapter one. I am not marking how realistic your art is, okay? It can be stick figures as long as it gets the idea across. So here's an example I did. Here's Jimmy. He's in his little plane. He says Jimmy is flying home. He's flying over Green Lake community. You can see there's the road. These are the houses. I put like a little tiny wave there. So it doesn't have to be amazing, but it shows me what I'm thinking about as I'm reading the novel. And one of the reasons is sometimes people don't realize that as people are reading the books, they're kind of making like a little movie in their head and they're picturing it as it happens. And not everybody does that. And then I think it makes it hard, the book harder to read. Um, so if you haven't tried 
picturing the action in a in a novel before this would be a great one to start because there's lots of actual actions it's not just talking so give it a shot for here we want four different pictures okay and this is the last question this is the one that everyone keeps forgetting um it is question six and it's talking about inferencing. I think the problem is they keep putting these little things before the question instead of after, and it sort of mixes people up. So again, I'm just gonna show you, it kind of basically goes, here we are, and it should be down here, okay? Complete the following phrases as best you can based on your predictions about the text and your thoughts and ideas after reading the text. So you're comparing what you did as predictions for assignment six to what you think now after you've read the first chapter. And again, only the first chapter, not the whole book. We're just doing the first chapter right now, okay? So based on what I've just read, I now realize what's changed. Has something in your thinking changed since you made your predictions? The evidence that supports my thinking is that what has happened? that ch has changed your thinking. Maybe you thought it was gonna be about an old man coming home to his community after many years, but now you realize, oh, it's a young person, right? So you would explain that. I can now conclude. It's a funny word, but conclude is just like, um, we talked about inferencing. What have you now realized? What do you now think? What have you now decided? I think, <laughs> they've got the dot 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 the dot 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 means i think and you explain what you think because and then you explain why so this these two down here these are the these are two parts of one sentence there are basically four sentences here okay they separate the last two but it's intended to be one sentence for example i think that dot 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 jimmy might have a hard time being back in his community because he dot, 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 and I would explain why I think he's going to have a hard time. Okay, what does making inferences mean? Making inferences, drawing conclusions, that's what they're talking about. Um, drawing conclusions refers to information that is implied or inferred, which just means that the information is never clearly stated, okay? Writers often tell you more through what they have the character doing than just saying it directly. They give you hints or clues that help you read between the lines. Using these clues um, to give you a deeper understanding of your reading, that's what we call inferring. And when you infer, you go beyond the surface details to see the other meanings that the details suggest or imply. They're not stated. When in the meanings of words or of actions or events are not stated clearly, they may be implied, suggested, or hinted. When meanings are implied, you may infer them, right? Inference is just a big old word that means a conclusion or a judgment. If you infer that something has happened, you don't see, hear, smell, or taste the actual event. But from what you know, it makes sense to think that it's happened. We make inferences all the time, every day. Most of the time, we do it without even thinking about it. Suppose you're sitting in your car, stopped at a red signal light, and you hear screeching tires, a loud crash, and breaking nothing. You can't see anything, but you can infer there's been a car accident. Maybe it's on a street over. We all know those sounds of a screeching tire and a crash. Those sounds almost always mean a car accident. Now, there could be some other reason or another explanation for the sounds. Maybe a car, maybe somebody... Um, fell through a window at the same time as a car hit the brakes, right? That would be odd, but it could have happened. Maybe an angry driver rammed into a parked car. Um, maybe somebody played the sound of a car crash from a recording. Maybe they're making a movie nearby. Making inference just means you're making a judgment call. You're usually choosing the most likely explanation from the facts that you have. It doesn't mean 100% that you're right, but that's okay. We... We make inferences all day to understand what's going on around us. And we make inferences when we read as well to understand what we're reading, okay? Um, 
for example, say a friend asks, why is Martha in such a bad mood? And we might say something like, well, I'm not sure, but you know, I did see her arguing with her boyfriend the other night at a restaurant. And then on the weekend, I saw him dancing with someone else at the bar. I think maybe they've broken up. Now, we don't know for sure because Martha hasn't said anything to us. We're just making an inference. And we can do that when we read as well. We don't have to wait for the author to tell us. We can just kind of look at what's happening and make a good guess or conclusion. So assignment number seven is kind of a long assignment because you also have to read chapter one um, as well. Let me just put the camera sure I mention that. To be able to finish it, you have to read chapter one to finish this assignment. Okay. You have to, it won't make any sense if you don't. All right. Um, oh, all right. So that's our big thing. I think I've answered most of everything. Is there anything I skipped over? I think we're pretty good. All right. Just quickly, how can we use dashes within a sentence? Dashes can be used to define a word. So for example, here, reconciliation, and then they define it. Dash, the restoring of, fam of friendly relationships. Dash is not possible unless truth is a part of that relationship. Dashes can also be used to provide a further explanation or a summary of the material that comes before the dash. He hated history, science, English, dash, every topic that needed reading, dash, every new school year. You can also introduce a short list within a sentence. His mom had bought everything, dash, pencil, eraser, binder, and pencil case, dash, a neon green color that he loved. I don't find dashes are used in people's writings as often as it used to be, but you will see it as we read, and I want you to be aware of what it's meaning or why it's doing things. Um, okay, you know what? I did this another day, and I already have the dashes in there, and I, I wanted to go through and do it. Maybe we'll have a chance to try this um, tomorrow. Hang on a sec. Put a little heart on here. Tomorrow, we'll give this a try, and see if we can practice it. Okay. So these are the meanings of dash. It's just a little bit different than what we've used before. Um, thank you so much for your patience today. Uh, let me know if you have trouble with these assignments. I know that these are a little bit harder than the previous assignments, I think. Um, so if you're finding yourself stuck or confused, call me. I'd be happy to talk with you and help you work out how to do these. Okay. Uh, tomorrow we will meet again and we'll talk about assignment eight tomorrow. Thank you so much for showing up and hope you have a good evening.